Right, I'm Vic, uh, Senior Platform Engineer at BME, and today I'm going to talk to you about service discovery. If you're on Twitter, my handle is at otaku underscore coder. Don't judge me, I made that a very long time ago. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about the journey we've made over the past couple of years at Beamly and how we've solved the service discovery problem. But what actually is service discovery? Now, Jason Wilder defines a problem like this. In a highly distributed architecture, how do clients determine the IPs and ports for a service that exists in multiple hosts? Now, when you think of the problem in that way, the answer seems pretty straightforward. You just keep a list of static hosts in Puppet or your configuration tool of the choice and use that to feed your host configuration. Pretty simple, right? Not quite. And in order to understand why it's such a big problem, we have to go back in time to the 20th of September, 2011. Puppet at T-Bone was born. Yeah, back in 2011, we were actually called T-Bone TV. And our uh, CTO at the time wanted to kind of say, make people say, instead of just uh, tweet it or uh, send a Facebook message to bone it. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, that didn't really quite fly. So back then, the architecture was very different. We had private DNS. We had a lot of handle instances. But we also had hard-coded lists in Puppet. But why is this a problem? So we look at a simple example. So we've got two components here. You've got feeds and CPT that need to talk to each other. And we want to add a new node and bring it into service. So we spin up a new node. But in order to bring it into service, you need to puppet run each of the feeds boxes. And once that run is complete, that new box is in service. Now, in this simple example, adding one new node needed to puppet run on three other nodes. In a more complicated architecture, such as for a persistence tier, you would have an unbounded number of changes for all of the upstream components that need to be updated. So this is quite a risky operation. It became a game of Jenga. And you didn't really know what was going to break. But the other thing is this is the cloud. You know, things come and go all the time. This isn't like that white, fluffy, silver-lined thing that recruiters love talking about and don't really understand. It is, in fact, a ball of chaos. So keeping a static list doesn't really work in a very dynamic architecture. But this kept us going for a while, up until the 3rd of January, 2013. At this point, our architecture had grown with very heavily leaning towards a service-oriented architecture, lots of back-end components, a lot of shit changing. And we decided that we needed a mid-tier load balancing solution. Now, we could have used HA proxy, we could have used Pound or one of these other solutions, but we decided to go with the Ryanair of load balancing solutions <laughs> called Balance. This thing was, I guess it was pretty good at being a load balancer, but from a DevOps point of view, it was pretty crap. It didn't support configuration files. It didn't really have any service management. You had to pass in a series of mystic incantations to the command line in order to make it work, and that was only for one port. So wrapping service management around this was, was quite a challenge, but it was a decision that was made, and it kind of brought us a few benefits. So in the previous example, the number of changes going on was, was unbounded. In this case, all the state or host state would be in one place, and as a result, it'd be a lot faster to get new nodes serving traffic. This is, of course, assuming that everything was using the load balancing tier but given we were in a transitionary phase, not everything was, and it was kind of like come and goes to what was using it. Uh, the other thing I should mention, uh, balance was so lightweight that it didn't even support health checking. Our CTO had to break out the C code and patch that in, which is kind of like what you'd expect as a minimum requirement for a load balancing solution. But if we, uh, if we look at an example again, so we've got the same two components, feeds and CPT that need to talk to each other, but in this case, the traffic is being routed by the load balancing tier. So to bring a new CPT node into service, you have to load balance, you have to puppet run just the balance tier. So the number of changes is bounded just to that tier. Unless, of course, you need to add a new balance node. But that was a very rare occurrence, thankfully. So this kept us going for quite a while up until 8th of July 2013, when we decided to move towards autoscaling. Now, in order to do that, we kind of took the approach of embracing immutable architecture. So 
uh, automated monitoring with Sensu, uh, centralized logging with Flume and Elasticsearch and Kibana, which basically meant there should be no need for anybody to SSH to a box. Everything's aggregated outside the box. So immutable infrastructure, all the configuration was pre-baked into the AMI. There's no instance puppet runs at all. Uh, basically, when we're baking the AMI, we were operating in uh, three Amazon regions and three environments per region, so that's nine variations in total. So the AMI would have nine versions of the configuration file for a component. And then on boot, we would inspect the instance tags, the component, env level, and region, and set the right configuration to use. And now this allowed us a lot of rapid scalability. Now, I don't know if you know a lot about Beamly, but back then we were all about the TV and we had a lot of last minute events with on-air calls to action, which meant we had a lot of very rapid, very short scalability requirements. And this kind of helped us along the way to meet them. But it also increased the rate of state change. And as a result of that, we needed a more dynamic host discovery platform. Balance was just not going to cut it with its, with its shitty code. So we iterated the architecture, and this time we moved to a proper load balancing solution, HAProxy, with a config update script. Now, this was a pseudo active active cluster. I call it pseudo active active because Amazon doesn't actually support multicast. So you kind of have to do all the heart beating yourself. You can't use uh, DRBD or any of the other solutions. Uh, it is. It was an auto-scaling, self-healing with static IPs. So if nodes disappeared, they would come back with exactly the same IP address. So upstream dependencies wouldn't need to update the configuration. Uh, and the updates, so the script would run every single minute. And in order to facilitate this, we also needed to move every single service in our estate onto a unique port. We wanted it to be globally unique, so then we can have a centralized registry. And the way the script works is there's a list of component port and health check mappings in a simple DB database. And the script ran every single minute to inspect this database and also called the Amazon APIs to figure out what instances were in that region and environment. And they compared the component tags against the database and basically used that to generate a valid HA proxy configuration. And if there is a change, it would diff it against what was on disk. And if there was a change, it would write that to disk and restart HA proxy. Sounds pretty complicated, but it's been working and still does. So let's take a look at how it works. So in this architecture, same components, feeds, CPT, but in this time, we've got HA proxy nodes. So when a new node comes up, the script runs, it checks the database, checks the Amazon API, finds the new node, writes the new configuration to disk and restarts HA proxy, which brings that new node into service. And this happened within a minute or two tops. So within a minute or two, Without any hands-on work, the new node was up and running and serving traffic. So what's the problem? Well, the problem here is it's a spoff. You know, if there's only two nodes running in an active-active pair, if they both die, then there is no intercomponent communication across the entire environment and region, which is pretty bad. Uh, and because it's only gained two nodes, there is a potential network I.O. bottleneck. So it all depends on the network device the size of the network devices attached to that particular instance size. It turns out they're pretty well sized, but if we did experience sudden rapid growth in traffic throughput, we would have to upsize, which would increase risk. And it does rely on the Amazon Metadata API being available. In fact, August the 13th, Amazon reported quite helpfully increased error rates, which resulted in instances not having any tagging information, which resulted in the script running, not finding anything, and there were an empty configuration to disk and just everything stopped. Now we've patched that bug, so it caches it, and if it can't find anything, it will carry on running with the previous configuration. But the point is you're relying on Amazon keeping their own services up, which, which is kind of like, if you're paying them for it, you'd expect that, but it doesn't always work that way. And of course, API rate limiting. Now, if we're running this script every minute, times two, times three environments, times three regions, so 18 potential scripts running every single minute, making a lot of heavy API calls, uh, when we first rolled this architecture out, we actually hit rate limiting on our, all of the Amazon APIs, which had knock-on effects elsewhere in the fleet. So this architecture works, but has a lot of caveats. And that brings us forward to, to 2015. Having had a look at all of the sort of service discovery solutions out there, we sort of settled on console. 
console is distributed, scalable, lightweight, well documented, ticks all the boxes. And it is written by Mitchell Hashimoto, who's basically written all of the coolest DevOps stuff in the past couple of years. So it's always good. Yeah, and it's in Go, which is ultra, ultra hipster, right? So architecture v4, there's a local agent in each instance, uh, a local HA proxy for that particular component's downstream dependencies, and new instances are discovered almost immediately. So as soon as the health check passes and that console deems that instance worthy of serving traffic, the update is sent across automatically to the rest of the cluster, and that instance is brought into service almost straight away. So how it works. Services register themselves on boot. Now internally we have what's called a, what we call a component metadata file. Every single repository has this little chunk of JSON that indicates what ports, services, health checks, run books, um, and various other tagging for a particular service. On boot, a script reads that, figures out what ports it needs to register the services for, generates the relevant config and registers that against the cluster. Then console template agent subscribes to changes for the relevant services and, and configuration keys that it needs to watch for. And then whenever there's a configuration change in the cluster, console template reg regenerates a new HA proxy configuration, reboots it, and that new node is brought into service. So let's look at a diagram. So kind of zoomed in a bit more, but on the feeds box, you've got the feeds component itself running, as well as the console agent, console template, and HA proxy. And we've got a CPT box down at the bottom. So, in order to bring a new CPT node into service, we just spin it up. It registers itself with the console cluster, which triggers an update event to the agent running on the feeds box, which then triggers a HA proxy update via console template, which reloads HA proxy and brings a new node into service. It's all automated, all happens within a fraction of a second, all good. Now, some of you might be asking, why didn't we go with Zookeeper? Netflix uses it, why? Why didn't you use it? Simple answer is Zookeeper doesn't really give you a lot out of the box. You have to build a lot of stuff on top of it. And it has clever things like ephemeral nodes, which are a bit more advanced than just basic health checking. But in order to use them, you increase the amount of client-side complexity to, to kind of talk to them. And CAP theorem, right? For those of you that aren't aware, CAP stands for Consistency, Availability, and Partition Tolerance. And the theory states that any database can only ever be any two of those things. In reality, it's a bit different. All databases are eventually consistent. The real question is whether you want to wait for that consistency or not. And with Zookeeper, you do. With Console, you don't. And we decided from a service discovery point of view, we just didn't need it to be that consistent. It would be eventually consistent across the architecture and it would eventually roll the node out. Now with the configuration side of things, if you're looking at the KV store, then you kind of do want that. So what console does offer you is, is tunable consistency in the same way that Cassandra and most other databases do offer it. So you can offer, uh, you can say, I, I want this, but I'll have a maximum about five or 10 second staleness to this query. And that allows you to read and write performance scales more linearly with the cluster size. And that's basically why we went with console. So that's where we are now. We are starting to roll it out, but not everything is rolling it out. And that's it. Any questions? Why console and not surf? So the question was, why console and not surf? And the answer is console is built on top of surf. Surf is a much lower level uh, protocol that uses gossip and the other cool stuff to discover nodes, but it doesn't give you the, the service discovery platform that the console is. It doesn't give you the APIs and so on. Oh, yeah. More questions? Any more questions? Yeah. So the question is, why use HA proxy instead of baking load balancing into the components themselves? The answer is, we've got a lot of components, like a ridiculous number of components. I think the last count was 80 plus components, give or take a couple of 20, say. So there's a lot of complexity in order to add client-side load balancing into the component code. And they'll move at different rates. Some are being updated on a weekly basis. Others haven't been updated in months. 
So to kind of update everything at once to, to support that is, is quite a challenge. And on top of that, a lot of the older code bases, the maintainers for those code bases have now left the company. So there's a lot of lack of understanding. So that's why we needed something outside of the component in order to, to, to do it for us. And it also means as an ops team, we can kind of do it side by side and let the engineers just carry on shipping code, which is what they're paid to do, right? Any more questions? Right, so the, the, the question was, given we adopted immutable infrastructure, why then adopt console KV, which then makes state change on the box itself? Okay, okay, so to rephrase the question, why didn't we just use console KV to write the configuration before, like one time before we roll out the instances? And the answer just comes from experience, really. I mean, when we first rolled out the immutable architecture, there was absolutely no change onto the box whatsoever. And this frustrated the engineers a fair bit. We have continuous deployment using uh, ThoughtWorks Go. And most of the time, in order to deploy configuration changes, they had to wait for the pipeline to go through the various stages. So making a one-line configuration change took maybe 40 minutes to get into live, which is a pretty long amount of time. And that frustration grew and grew and grew. And that's why we kind of came up with a compromise where we gave them the ability to make these configuration changes, but still benefit from the rest of the, the benefits from having an immutable architecture. And that's why we took that approach. Any more questions? Contemplating etcd, the dynamic configuration. Uh, sure. So we did look at etcd, um, but also console template has better integration with console. We've already adopted console. Why not just go fully in bed with it and, and use it all together? So console template makes use of a number of additional APIs that etcd would doesn't. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear that. Yeah. So the question was, how many console nodes do we have against the size of our fleet? Uh, right now, we have three console nodes operating in one region. And we have, I, don't know, I think at the last count, 500, 600 instances on Amazon. Uh, right now, not everything is configured to use console. So obviously, over time, we probably have to scale out the infrastructure. But right now, that's, that's what it is. Any more? So the question was, do we have a single data center or multiple data centers? We originally started with multiple data centers. We had a console cluster per environment region. So that meant we had nine different data centers, but we realized we didn't need that much complexity just yet. So we decided to operate with just one collapse into one data center. And then as we go, we'll see whether we need to scale out to separate data centers. Any more? That's it. Thank you very much.